Hi, Dr. Belgrave. Thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, we're really excited to have you. Um, so you've done fantastic work at the intersection of AI and mental health, particularly with uh, Project Talia. Could you talk a little bit about what that project's about, um, kind of your work there? Okay, well, thank you for having me on board, Katie, with this and Megan. Um, so Project Talia is all about how we could use machine learning to improve mental health. And it's a collaboration with Silver Cloud Health, which is the largest mental health provider in the UK. Um, and they're using something called internet-based cognitive behavioral therapy. So in Project Talia, what we're doing is trying to understand how we can understand different groups of patients using machine learning. So we're using a method called probabilistic graphical modeling to try to see whether we can um, disentangle this heterogeneity of, of symptoms among different patients as well. And the idea is that we can get the right treatment to the right patients at the right time by understanding this underlying heterogeneity. So we're using lots of different machine learning tools to try to disentangle heterogeneity, but also trying to understand what are the things that make different subgroups or subtypes of patients better as well. Fascinating and really important. Um, what kind of data sources are you primarily using for this project? I've seen you've used, started to use social media uh, posts. Do you think that kind of the wealth of data that's now being put online is useful in some way to understand mental health? So the collaboration that we're doing is with Silver Cloud Health. And um, so they have an online platform that patients can use. So it's anonymized, totally anonymized, the identified data um, that we're using so there are no sort of text we don't we don't know any of the texts that people are using um and so what we've looked at are depression and anxiety scores and we've looked at patterns of usage over time as well so the idea is do those patterns of usage how you use cognitive behavioral therapy and how you use these interventions does it have an impact on depression and anxiety um and the idea is that the more that a lot of the literature says, the more that you use cognitive behavioral therapy, the better your outcomes. So the better your depression or the better your anxiety over time. But what we actually found in a recent study we published last month is actually that it's not just how much you use these platforms, but it's also the way you interact with these platforms as well. And um, so using the platform as it's usually prescribed generally helps people to get better. And what we saw is that there are actually different types of engagers. So there are some people who drop out quite quickly, but dropping out quite quickly doesn't mean that you're not going to get better. Maybe those are just people who, who use the platform as prescribed very quickly, and then they're able, to, they're able to improve their scores quite quickly and more effectively as well. Interesting. And you kind of talked a little bit about this with the probabilistic graphical models, but could you talk a bit more about what kinds of new AI tools you might be developing to tackle these kinds of problems? Do existing deep networks work or mm -hmm. do you kind of need to go to more neurosymbolic or probabilistic um, like combinatorial approaches to uh, do this work? That's a great question, actually. So my, um, my sort of background is more in probabilistic graphical modeling. And I think one of the big advantages of using probabilistic graphical modeling is that um, you have probabilities. So the, the interpretation of these models is a lot more intuitive um, and you can condition probabilities of what's happening to the patients at a particular time based on their history of events. Um, and you raise the point about using neural networks and deep learning and these are fantastic approaches to use, especially with the wealth of data that we have. So there more than 1,000 different tools people can use on the platform. So in order to try to make predictions around clinical outcomes and trying to understand this intervention, these are good tools to use as well to try to understand, well, um, can, we, can we make predictions quickly for patients and try to, understand, um, try to understand better predictive models and develop better predictive models as well. So we use quite a lot of a range of, um, a range of tools. And the important thing is that we're very problem focused and very patient focused as well. So it's all about um, trying to understand what are, the, what are the relevant questions and what are the things that we can solve using machine learning, and then trying to see what are the right tools for doing that. So things like predictive modeling, of course, we want to use um, neural networks, especially 
with the wealth of data using data over time. So we use RNNs, that sort of thing. Um, I also want to highlight something with this as well. What I was saying with um, these methods being very patient centered and we're very problem driven, driven by what are the needs of the patients and also what are the needs of the people helping the patients as well. So a lot of our work is actually focused towards understanding therapists, understanding supporters, so that we can create tools for them. Um, so the platform Silver Cloud Health, um, there's a human in the loop. And um, a lot of work we do actually is on the so social science aspect as well. So with the social science aspect, trying, what we're doing is trying to understand the users and what are the use cases that are that are most beneficial for patients suffering from depression and anxiety. So this is what really drives our machine learning work. And I think this is really important and it's quite exciting as well. It's awesome. So you kind of mentioned working with therapists and the people that are interacting with the patients. Have you, has there been anything interesting kind of collaborating as a like machine learning researcher with people that are kind of out in the field working with patients? Um, has anything surprised you? Is there a certain way that you need to approach kind of describing predictions that your model has made? Um, anything you've learned in that front? Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, and I think for me working in machine learning for healthcare in general, this is what I've always found fascinating, um, being able to tap into domain experts who are actually on the ground helping patients. Um, so before working in mental health, a lot of my work was actually in respiratory medicine. Um, and I spent 10 years working with a clinician, with a few clinicians in the respiratory medicine scenario. And um, I think this is really important to try to understand from the domain experts, what are the, what are the important problems? And um, I don't know, I think working in a machine learning context in an applied domain, it's quite hard work because sometimes it's almost like you're doing translation across two different languages um, where I'm not a clinical expert. I have no idea about the healthcare domain, but I care about these problems because they're problems that people face. So problems of asthma, allergy, problems of mental health. And um, so for me, it's fascinating working with experts who actually know the domain and trying to come up with models to quantify things as well, not just to quantify, but to make predictions and to promote interventions as well that would help different patients. Um, so also there's, a, there's the translation process as well from machine learning to the domain experts as well. And um, a lot of the work that I do is focus on how to make these models more interpretable as well, how to, um, and this becomes more and more challenging, uh, the more black boxy model is. So for example, with things like deep learning, RNNs, um, interpretability is an important question because sometimes the models make good predictions, but you want to know, well, why is it making that prediction? What are the main features that are driving those predictions as well? Kind of going a little bit deeper into your, earlier work before Project Talia, you worked at multiple different scales, kind of from the genomic scale to patient level macro scale. Do you have a favorite um, kind of scale of problem to work on? Does your modeling approach change um, significantly when you go like across these uh, uh, domains? That's a, that's a very interesting question, favorite scale. So I love working with, uh, I don't know whether it's because it's my sort of home base, but I really love working with um, with longitudinal observational data. Um, yeah, I think I think that's 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 my favorite because um, so I have worked in lots of different settings, and um, a lot of other settings are deterministic, but you never know what someone's going to answer. So to me, observational studies, you can collect a lot more information. Like if you ask questions of people, you could collect a lot more information than if you um, take blood samples, because maybe not everybody would want to have a blood sample. Um, with genetics, you have a large scale of data, but that data is noisy. Um, observational data is noisy in a different way, uh, where you never know what someone's going to answer. And also, um, one of the things I'm fascinated with is measuring uncertainty. So uncertainty and what we say about ourselves and how we also, um, how we self-assess our own symptoms. And this is something that 
I think in, in asthma and pathology was very, was very clear where you had, um, so the study I was looking at was a longitudinal birth cohort. So people were, children were coming into the study from birth uh, until they were about 16. And because a baby can't answer for themselves about their symptoms and what they're experiencing, you're relying on parents to assess that. And um, very often it was what, you, what a parent would say would be very different to what a doctor would say. So one example would be um, where one of the questions on the questionnaire was asking a child, asking not the child, the parent, has your child's wheeze in the past 12 months? If you look at their GP records and if you listen to their parents' answers, sometimes they're widely different. So one says yes and one says no. And, um, and trying to understand measures of uncertainty is, is really important. And um, I find it really fascinating also thinking of it in terms of mental health as well, where typically um, the data that I've been looking at is measuring something called PHQ-9 and GAD-7. So PHQ-9 is Patient's Healthcare Questionnaire, which is a set of nine questions rated from zero to three. So I think zero is not at all, and three is very likely. So for example, they could be questions about, um, about different aspects of depression. And with these, with these sorts of, um, these are very subjective measures because you're asking someone about how they've been in the past two weeks. And I think we can make very much better diagnoses if we can understand uncertainty in a, in a, in a more structured way. So this is one of the problems that I'm fascinated about in machine learning for healthcare, trying to understand what's the true measurement. And it's not just with observational data where you're asking a patient a question about evaluating themselves, but also you can see this in other measurements that are quite variable as well. So for example, if you have patients in the ICU, the creatinine level could go up and down from day to day as well. So there's a lot of variation in trying to understand what is the true measure or something like um, image recognition as well, where maybe if you have two experts looking at a cancer tumor in patients, um, how do you make sure that they calibrate? Can you use machine learning to, to calibrate across different raters or across different ratings of a DB? Interesting. So kind of going off that, what do you see as some of the biggest challenges going forward um, in AI and its relation to biomedicine? This is a this is a very good question. Um, so I think that there, I think that the main challenge of AI for healthcare is um is I'll I'll say that it's a challenge with with the patients. So um trying to understand what are the most meaningful things we should be working on in AI for healthcare, I think it's the number one challenge. Um, the number two challenge is uptake of artificial intelligence in healthcare as well, uh, because sometimes maybe, um, so you can develop a great algorithm, but is the end user it's intended for, are they going to use it? So trying to understand what are the obstacles to usage of AI for healthcare, I think is an important, um, an important blocker to try to that an important challenge that we have to try to understand and get over as well um, if we want artificial intelligence for healthcare to make a difference. Um, I think also uh, understanding heterogeneity in patients, which is one of the things that I've been working on a lot as well. Um, that a lot of healthcare we're looking at average effects um, when we're looking at interventions for patients. So one big challenge is how can we understand heterogeneity and also how can we scale interventions for heterogeneous groups as well? So an example would be um, when I was working on asthma and allergic diseases, we identified five different subtypes of, of asthma and we found that there was a, a tiny proportion of people with persistent asthma who weren't responding to treatments. And that was 3% of a population of asthmatics. And in order to get medications that actually scale to this is a heterogeneous subgroup of patients who don't respond, what can we do? What interventions can we create? So I think um, I don't have the answer for this, but how can we actually um, make interventions that are meaningful for these heterogeneous groups as well? And what excites you most about your research and kind of the field going forward? 
Uh, I'm really excited about mental health. Um, I think it's a fantastic area to work in. And for me, just knowing that, um, you know, we could, we could make a difference um, by understanding the space in a more structured way is just fascinating. Um, it's an area that I've always been, I've always really cared about, and I'm so happy to have the opportunity to work in mental health, um, just because it's so uninvestigated. And at the same time, one in four of us at some point in our lives um, is confronted with a mental health condition. So I am really excited about artificial intelligence and machine learning making a difference there, um, because. Sometimes it's just a tiny difference you have to make. And I think this is maybe one of the really exciting things that we have to keep optimistic about in the field of machine learning and artificial intelligence for healthcare, that very often the actual intervention that we make is going to be very small. It's not going to be, we are going to change the world with one algorithm, but we're going to make small changes and those small changes add up to a lot. So I'm super excited about that. It's really uh, inspirational and really phenomenal work that you're doing um, with Thank AI you. and mental health. Um, Thank you. Yeah, kind of shifting gears a little bit, could you talk a little bit about your trajectory? How did you get into AI and healthcare? Okay, so um, I think working in, so I started off as a statistician um, and I always give credit to when I was, um, when I was 14. So I was failing math and um, my mum took me to a teacher in Trinidad, which is where I'm from. Uh, and this teacher just was so inspiring. So he, I think, it, you know, having good teachers and teachers who believe in you is just so important. So this man transformed my life um, and really got me to love math. And he thought I was brilliant at math. So I became brilliant at math. Um, so it was like a self-fulfilling prophecy. So he really inspired me to, um, to look at becoming a statistician in the pharmaceutical industry. So since I was 15, I had this idea, I have to study math and statistics and work in the pharmaceutical industry. Um, but then I guess a lot of things changed. So I went, to, I went to London School of Economics and I did math and statistics there, but always knowing, even though I went to business school, thinking I really want to go into, into healthcare and um, looking at the impact that math and statistics could have in healthcare. And eventually, um, I did my master's at University College in London. And then, um, then I decided to do my PhD in the University of Manchester. So I got a scholarship from Microsoft Research to do my PhD. And it was very much looking at the intersection. This was when machine learning was just starting. So thinking about how we can push the boundaries of statistics and use, we were at a time in 2010 when there was more computational power. So how can we use machine learning to understand patient heterogeneity? So this was the start of my, of my journey into machine learning for healthcare. And um, it was just really fascinating, this combination between statistics and computer science and really exploring how much computational power can do for understanding of healthcare. Also, it was a time of explosion in data as well. So the type of data and the variety of data, the genomics data, metagenomics, um, there, was, it, it, there was a lot of promise and a lot of treasure as well, where we can understand people in, and patients in ways that we couldn't before. So it was a time of very exciting development. And this is what brought me into machine learning for healthcare. So since then, um, my ambition has been looking at how we can create generalized machine learning frameworks for personalized healthcare through understanding the structure in disease heterogeneity as well. And kind of, could you talk a little bit about working in industry versus um, kind of in academia for people that might be really excited about these problems and unsure whether they should kind of go into an academic setting like in the future or uh, uh, to industry? Very good question. Um, so I, I don't know if I have a blanket answer for this, but one thing that has always, that I've always felt very lucky about and also that um, now when I think back on it, I think is really important to influence decisions is the people you work with. 
So it's not so much about, at least for me, it's not so much about academia and industry. I think it's more about who are the people, who are your collaborators, who are your mentors. And this is what we need to look at um, because that's, it's the, the people who are around us who help us to grow and help us to develop in our research and we help them to develop as well. But I think especially um, thinking of decisions, it's who do I want to, who do I want to be my mentors? Who do I look up to? Can I work with them? So that for me is the, is the most important thing. Um, and people succeed in different environments. People have preferences for different environments as well. Um, there may be times when maybe there's a preference for academia, maybe there's a preference for industry. But I think sometimes what we need to look at is not just the location, but also it's, it's about the whole environment. Who are the people I'm going to work with? Are they happy where they're working? Is it a good environment of research? Am I going to do really exciting work? Um, so I think these things are, are really important. I see. Um, and for students that are interested in learning about or kind of getting into machine learning, how would you recommend they start kind of going on the theory side first of like the math and statistics and computer science or starting with an applied problem and then kind of bootstrapping their way to figure out what math they need to learn? Um, do you have any uh, recommendations for students in that area? Yeah, so I think, I think there, um, there's many paths to, to entering the field as there are people as well. So um, I do believe in having strong mathematical foundations. And uh, I think this is one thing that, um, that does give you an edge, uh, having that understanding. But as well, the theory, if, if people are interested in machine learning for healthcare, the theory has to be very linked to the application as well. So getting exposure to, to solving problems is a hard skill as well. Um, understanding problem solving skills, so things like uh, Kaggle or different challenges as well can be useful. Um, so I think working in ap applied machine learning is very much um, having your having your eggs in lots of baskets. So it does mean that you have to have good theoretical underpinnings, but also good practical and problem solving underpinnings as well. So these two school um, tool sets need practicing and developing as well. And kind of final question, do you have any uh, advice for students um, that you'd like to share? Oh, wow. Um, let's see, I think, uh, I think, you know, so I do believe a lot in um, in having balance. So let's see, good advice. Um, I think do things that you're passionate about and that interest you. So don't try to fit into a mold um, of what is the most cool topic or, you know, do what interests you and what you're passionate about. And another piece of advice is surround yourself with good collaborators as well. Um, you know, don't be shy about talking to people, reaching out to people, and, uh, and getting to know people. Um, I think the research community is quite rich, the machine learning community is quite rich, and um, get to know your peers, really form strong peer networks, uh, because it's your peers that are going to help you and be your future collaborators in research as well. So take care of your research, but also take care of the people around you as well. That's great advice. Uh, thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, it was awesome. Thank you, Katie. You're thank such you. a good interviewer. It's amazing. <laughs>